And uh, this is uh, joint work with a number of colleagues. So most important, uh, Friedrich Lenz uh, uh, did his PhD with me exactly onto this project. So uh, I'm going to tell you about his work. And uh, Thomas Ings and Lars Chitgar are two experimental biologists, colleagues of mine at Queen Mary. Uh, so they did all the experiments on bumblebees. Uh, and uh, uh, Alexei Chechkin is an expert on uh, stochastic theory. Uh, and my expertise is also from a theoretical uh, point of view. So that was um, a joint collaboration. And as this uh, workshop is quite cross-disciplinary, and I feel perhaps a little bit uh, as an outsider, I thought I'd give you on one slide uh, just a little bit of my scientific background that you know what to expect. So my background is theoretical physics, uh, uh, interfacing with applied mathematics. Uh, so I'm in a math department at Queen Mary. And uh, my field is really nonlinear dynamics, uh, stochastic processes, and non equilibrium statistical physics. And more recently, I like to apply this to nanosystems and uh, especially to biological dynamics. Well, here you have some pictures, so I'm interested in things like fractals, diffusion in dynamic systems as well. And as I'm very interested in diffusion, uh, there was a natural cross-link then to uh, biological applications. And that's what I started to study about 10, 15 years ago. And I'm getting more and more into it. And in fact, I will come to exactly this uh, picture to the end. You will see it again. Uh, and so you see a bumblebee that performs a flight, and indeed this is a trajectory generated from a model, and I will explain to you how we did that, at least on one slide. And now as you're talking about biological dynamics, um, I may start with this uh, cartoon uh, to introduce the basic theme of this talk, because what I'm interested in is really analyzing search patterns, biological search patterns. And as an example, well, this is from a nature paper by Chopin, Binichou, and others. You may think of, um, uh, well, uh, in autumn, uh, that you're out in the woods uh, searching for mushrooms. And uh, as a theoretical physicist, I would like to model this problem. And now the most naive approach, well, we have already heard about it, is, OK, you uh, put everything onto a quadratic grid in the plane. Quadratic grid. And uh, now you put the mushrooms uh, randomly on some nodes of the grid. And then you take uh, model the searcher as a point particle that moves uh, with probability one quarter to the left, to the right, up or down. Fine. OK, now you have a search problem. And that's what we uh, theoretical physicists like to play around with. And you can solve this or put it on a computer. Now, if you want to do better, then if you want to go to continuous time and space, uh, you may uh, model the search, say, by Brownian in motion. Um, so a uh, particle, say, moving in a fluid here in 2D, and again, looking for randomly distributed targets. So far, so good. But I mean, this workshop is on locomotion and navigation, right? And this has absolutely nothing to do with locomotion and navigation. So it's a point particle moving according to some rules, finding some point target. So, this is nice because you can solve this analytically, but uh, I'm not sure whether it tells you very much. And now that if you look at search problems, very quickly they can become very complicated. The problem is that then we can't solve them anymore, but uh, they are more real. Uh, they are closer to biological reality. So to give, uh, to give a flavor, um, yeah, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, one thing is uh, whether you want to find all of them or only perhaps one of them or a few of them. Finding all of them, for example, was done exactly in this paper. It's called cover times. So you can develop, develop then theories uh, of how to efficiently find all of the targets in a certain region. Finding, say, one of them is mathematically a problem of first passage or first arrival. Again, you can solve this analytically in certain situations. But now the question is also, you may wish to um, do efficient search in terms of optimality. How, but, but what do you mean with efficient? Next question. Efficient may mean you want to minimize the search time. Right? And again, this is a problem that you can solve under certain circumstances. But this is not all, because now they come into play locomotion, navigation, and perception. Right? So certainly, this is not just a point part in reality looking for some targets. Uh, it depends on your locomotion of whether you find them or not. If you move very quickly, you may easily miss them. Right? Then sensory perception, you see this uh, person has a, a certain range of perception, of course. It depends on your perception of how you interact with the environment, uh, whether you find targets easily or not. Uh, another problem is, for example, search form depends on whether here, if you pick uh, a mushroom, it's gone. Right? If you have a replenishing of, uh, uh, a target, you have a completely different search problem. 
okay, I stop here, I could go on, of course, but you see I'm covering the whole range from extremely abstract mathematical models that we are happy to solve up to models that are of interest to most of you, I suppose, as if you're experimental biologists, right? And so this is a problem here to bring this together. It's not easy. And one has to watch out here that one establishes a clear communication because if you solve a search problem, it may not be what you're interested in. Now to summarize, uh, and uh, I may go through this picture. Um, uh, this, uh, five, four years ago at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, uh, we had an uh, advanced study group where we brought together stochastic theorists, experimental biologists, and people doing statistical physics, and we stuck our heads together um, to make sense out of uh, applying search uh, theories to understand biological dynamics. And here you see the title, Statistical Physics uh, Meets Movement Ecology. Uh, it's something well, I may advertise Rand's talk later today, right? You will talk about this in more detail, the discipline of movement ecology. So this is just a very small subset of it in view of search. So the picture is as follows. So this is the game you really need to play if you want to take things seriously. Now we have a frog moving in some environments, okay? And what you can do, and we have heard about this, uh, is you put a sensor onto the frog and you measure the path uh, of the frog of how it moves, okay? Uh, and a certain index with the environment in a certain way, so according to locomotion, uh, here the interaction also uh, um, with respect to a certain perception and of how the environment is structured. And then certainly it also has a brain, so a certain memory. Now all what you record is uh, then uh, the movement ecology da data, meaning the path. Okay. And uh, so this is now the experimental input, and as a theorist, now the statistical physics comes into play, right? What we want is, to analyze the data and to construct a model by which you can reproduce this data, ideally. So you play the following game. Uh, ideally, you want to capture as many uh, details of uh, the natural environment as possible, right? So we are here. You may put this, for example, into a computer, do a computer simulation, and uh, try to build a very complex model. Then you start here. But now if you want to do really theory, meaning if you want to calculate something, and obtaining analytical solutions, you need to simplify. And meaning we go up here. You, so you see on the lowest level, we keep a lot of model complexity, but we uh, pay a price because we can't do very much apart from simulation. Now uh, you may do what in statistical physics is called cost graining, meaning you neglect details. You throw out information. For example, here uh, you neglect many details of the real environment. You simplify it. And now you see we can go even further. Here we still, uh, still have perception, but that's too complicated, so we kill it, we kick it out. Then we are here, we only keep, say, memory uh, and uh, interaction with the environment. And here even further, you see now we have eliminated any memory. This is, in a, in a way, a point particle moving in an environment. If you, and if you reverse the arrow, we are back to the random walks I started with, right? Then this would be a point particle that moves according to certain dynamics in some environment. And this is something you can still solve as serious, but as an experimentalist, again, you may not be very happy but you have this whole range of models. Now you take your model uh, and you either solve it exactly or you do simulations and you generate again synthetic trajectories. Then you analyze them according to some averaging. I don't go into detail here. And you calculate observables, which again, then you can match to your data. So this is really, in our view, that's what we came up with, a game you need to play if you really want to understand the biological search problem. But you see it's quite difficult. But I will exactly illustrate this now in the following. So the general framework is what uh, one may call the physics of foraging. And there's a very nice book with the same title by a certain group of people uh, where uh, um, yeah, they study this. And my interest is in, uh, to, in identifying biologically relevant search strategies by mathematical modeling. And now what I'm going to tell you, that was a lengthy introduction, but I just wanted to properly set the scene, is uh, an experiment on bumblebee foraging in a lab under predation risk. And so I will explain to you the experiment, the statistical data analysis that we did, and to the end, the stochastic models we come up with. So that's the goal. Okay, so um, now let's get into business. Um, bumblebees, if they try to find food, uh, face two very practical problems. So A, uh, if you're out in the wild, uh, you have a very nice uh, meadow. And so they need to find food in a very complex landscape. However, life may not always be easy. Uh, for example, uh, there are these uh, uh, crab spiders uh, here. You see them and they can even camouflage, so they can change their color. So in order to survive, they need uh, to uh, avoid the predators. 
And that poses the question, okay, what type of motion should they perform in order to optimize their foraging and to avoid the predators? And my colleagues, Lars Schitka and Tom Ings, uh, they did a very nice uh, lab experiment as follows. And it's published here in this paper. So um, they um, uh, let uh, bumblebees foraging in a cube of about 75 uh, centimeter side length. You see here a picture. And uh, one wall of uh, this cube was equipped uh, with a grid of artificial yellow flowers, so four times four grid. Uh, and uh, uh, each flower was equipped with an artificial nectar source, and the bumblebees were trained to feed on them. And uh, now uh, they took two cameras, and uh, with the cameras, uh, the position of the bumblebees could be tracked with a very high frame rate. rate you see 50 frames per second. And here you see a trajectory of uh, one uh, bumblebee. So only one was left into the box uh, here uh, at the front uh, uh, side, and then uh, performed the foraging. The advantage of this experiment is certainly it's in the lab, so you have full control about everything. Uh, and especially here you can vary the environment in a systematic way. This advantage is certainly there's no real free flight of a bumblebee, because I was at least told by the biologists that they can always see the walls. You see it's a very small box, so we certainly cannot conclude on a free flight of a bumblebee, but that was not the point. The point was rather here that we could vary the environment as follows. Uh, now, uh, Tom uh, put uh, on four out of the 16 artificial flowers, artificial spider models. So you see one here. So it's this uh, white plastic uh, thing uh, that he glued onto four randomly distributed uh, artificial flowers. And now you see actually there is a mechanism here by which you can gently squeeze a bumblebee. So no bumblebee was harmed in the experiment, I was told. Okay. Um, so uh, there are safe flowers without the spider images and dangerous flowers. And indeed, there was a training phase uh, where the bumblebees uh, learned to avoid the dangerous flowers, meaning when they approached the flower, then Tom was sitting there and then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, then squeezing them gently and holding them for two seconds. And of course, they didn't like it, so they were trained to avoid the flowers. Um, uh, in detail, this was a very complex experiment. It consisted uh, of seven stages for our analysis. We were only interested in three of them. Uh, spider free foraging, so no spider images. Then foraging and predation risk to one quarter equipped with spider images and a memory test one day later. So uh, uh, after the night, then it was tested whether they still uh, memorized to avoid the dangerous flowers. And uh, about 30 bumblebees were studied, and uh, we had on average about 6,000 data points per bumblebee for the data analysis. So this was the experiment. OK, and now as a theorist, uh, we wanted to reanalyze the data uh, in view of the following two questions. First of all, uh, uh, certainly uh, I would, I'm very interested in what type of motion the bumblebees perform in terms, in terms of stochastic dynamics, meaning what I'm interested in is really to build a stochastic model that can reproduce uh, this kind of knot of spaghetti, or it looks like it a little bit. Uh, but secondly, in this context, especially are there then changes of the dynamics under variation of the environmental conditions. Certainly, naturally, you would expect that if the uh, bumblebees move without spiders on the flowers, I mean, they are quite happy because there is no risk. But if they perceive that there are spiders there, that they are getting nervous, right? And that they may change their type of motion. And the question is, how do they change their motion? Can you quantify this? So this was the question that uh, we were posing. OK, so here's our data analysis. The first thing we did uh, was uh, to extract uh, velocity distribution functions. So here you see actually a semi-logarithmic plot. So this is the logarithmic axis, and this is linear. And these are the velocities of uh, a bumblebee parallel to the y-axis. Perhaps just to go back, uh, sorry. So you see y is parallel to the wall, x is perpendicular to the wall, z is the vertical. And here, as an example, I just show you the one parallel to the wall. And uh, the black uh, uh, line, the thick line with the crosses, uh, this uh, is the data. And the other ones are fit uh, with certain functions. And you see, we try to fit this uh, with via maximum likelihood with a mixture of two Gaussians. That's the red line, exponential, the blue one, power law, the green one, and the single Gaussian, which is the pink one. 
And you see just by visual inspection, you can immediately rule out two of them, which it's uh, not a single Gaussian, and uh, it's, not exponen uh, no, it's not a power law either. So that's very clear. However, whether it's a mixture of two Gaussians or exponential is not so clear. And I mean, this is one of the notoriously difficult questions in this whole business. Uh, you, you extract a PDF from your data, what kind of function is that? It's, normal, it's very difficult to answer this question, but you can do something. And for example, a method that is very convenient is the quantile quantile plot, meaning you plot regions of equal probability of your probability distribution uh, that you have in the, uh, from the data against your uh, prospective uh, function that you speculate fits the data. And if it matches, you get a straight line. So it's very easy, and I can recommend it if you don't know about it already. So here, you plot uh, the data PDF against your f uh, prospective candidate function. And again, you see here, it's pit very, very well a, a straight line. The red lines are actually surrogate data, so they give you the error bars, and the matching is pretty perfect for actually a mixture of two Gaussians. And you see it here. Actually, uh, if you take a close look, Though we don't have much data here, but you see we have a little peak here, which is the little Gaussian with the smaller variance. And then we have as a background a big Gaussian with a big variance. And so this is our finding that this is the probability solution that we get. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, yeah, this is the best fit. And I mean, we verified this by information criteria. You can do base uh, analysis. And then there are so-called weights, uh, uh, information criteria, base uh, criteria for the experts. And we really checked also quantitatively that uh, double Gaussian is the best. And this certainly has a very simple biological explanation because there are two different flight modes, spatial flight modes. So one is if the bumblebee is far away from a flower, so then it flies around with a big Gaussian. So with a big distribution of velocities. If it approaches a flower, so then, uh, in fact, uh, it reduces the speed, and then it forages with a small Gaussian on top of it. And so there's really a spatial separation of the different flight modes. And we check that uh, by uh, uh, eliminating from the data the data near to, uh, to the flower, and then we only got the big Gaussian. So it's a spatial variation of, of the flights. And in a way, we physicists call this intermittent dynamics. Intermittent means you sample between two different stochastic processes, and here's a spatial sampling. Now there comes the surprise. Um, we did this certainly for uh, the different phases, especially for the spider phase and the non-spider phase. And I asked my PhD student, well, look at it. There should be a difference, right? That's what, would, what you would naively expect, that if uh, you have spiders there, you should get a different probability distribution. And I told my PhD student, yeah, I mean, do it. And he came to me and said, well, I don't find any difference. Sorry. And uh, after one year, uh, we gave up. Uh, then uh, I told him, OK, I mean, we are not getting, making progress. Uh, let's forget about it. We do something else. We couldn't find any difference. So they were meaning the uh, velocity probability distributions for all the phases were exactly the same within uh, error, uh, error bars. That was the state of the art, so we couldn't see any difference. Then I told him, OK, look at correlation functions. That's the next best thing to do. And indeed, the answer was there. And that was a big surprise to us. Uh, so uh, physicists call this a velocity autocorrelation function. Uh, in statistics, it's called covariance. And if you don't know about it, I can only highly recommend it uh, for statistical data analysis. OK, I don't have much time, no, f a few minutes, right? Um, but if you want, I can certainly explain to you what the correlation function is. The, uh, the point is uh, it tells you about memory in the dynamics, meaning how much your dynamics is correlated uh, in time. So meaning uh, this correlation function is optimal. Say, I mean, you st the, uh, the bumblebee starts with a velocity in a certain direction. And then you check how much your velocity at time t is correlated to this initial velocity. So meaning if it's still parallel, the correlation function is maximal. You see here. That's why it starts uh, from 1. It's normalized. But then uh, certainly the uh, velocity will vary. And then this is a scalar product if you uh, do it via vectors, meaning if it's perpendicular, it's 0. If it's anti-parallel, it's negative. So this velocity correlation function gives you very nice information of how your trajectory looks like. Again, here, uh, then first uh, it flies parallel, then it may mess around, and if it's negative, uh, in fact, it has reversed its direction. And you see that exactly this is going on here. So th this is the velocity autocorrelation function parallel, again, to the feeding uh, plane uh, for the three stages. Uh, so this is a spider-free. 
uh, predation thread and memory test, you see uh, the latter two are quite identical. But this means in the spider fee stage, uh, the bumblebees fly quite persistently in the same direction. They are not worried, uh, so they're approaching the flower very fast. That's what it means. But you see that for the infested stages, you have anti-correlations, meaning uh, it starts here, but then it reverses the direction, so it flies anti-parallel. So that means the bumblebee flies to the flower, but then spots, oh, there's a problem, there's a spider there, so it makes a turn. And this is exactly why this becomes negative, so they turn. And that means the explanation is, we observe no change in the PDFs, and if any one of you has an explanation for that, I would be very happy to hear it. So it seems for, perhaps for a biological reason, they don't want to or they don't, can't change their velocity or speed distribution. It's the same. However, what they do change is the topo topology of their trajectories. So all the information about the interaction with the environment is in the topology, not in the speeds. So they perform more curved trajectories, which a lot, so of course makes a lot of sense, sense because they are more careful. They're checking out the situation. So that's what we find. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's uh, what I have said. All the changes regarding the phases are in the velocity correlations, not in the PDFs. So if you do data analysis, do not all, always focus on the probability distributions. That may not be the whole story. And we did something else, or uh, uh, a bit more, because we wanted to check for the interaction with the environment as follows. We defined what one may call predator avoidance in a very simple way, because uh, Friedrich looked at the position probability distributions in front of a flower. So in fact, this is wrong. That should be a Z and Y. Sorry for that. But so you see, this is a plane exactly in front of a flower. And this is simply the difference uh, of the probability distributions, the spatial ones, uh, between the phase where there's no uh, spider minus no spider. And you see, in fact, here there's a peak, and uh, here uh, above the peak there's a minimum. So this means, uh, in fact, uh, the minimum says it's avoidance. Uh, so if there's a, a flower with a spider, the bumblebee approaches the flower, but then sees, aha, there's a problem, so I fly back, so certainly it will not stay there, it will move away. And this means hovering. So this means, in fact, uh, the bumblebee then stays in front of the flower, a little bit uh, uh, below, and checks out the situation. So we can quantify this. This is from the data. And I should say the uh, bumblebee typically approaches the flower from the top. So it goes like this. And then it sees there's a problem. That's why there's a minimum. And then it goes back and uh, hovers almost uh, horizontally in front of the flower. And now we modeled this by a simple so-called Langevin equation. But if you're not familiar with that, it's a stochastic differential equation where this is a kind of Newton law. So this is, uh, in a way, the force, uh, mass we have scaled away. It's on the right-hand side. And this is uh, the following. This is a kind of friction. Uh, it's a friction coefficient. And this is a force that models the interaction with the flower. So this is a potential derivative of it. And this is Gaussian white noise. For physicists, this is very familiar. If you're an experimental biologist, perhaps not so much. But this, in a way, models what's called Brownian motion. But here, Brownian motion with an interaction. And this thing, uh, if uh, there is no spider, we switch it off, so we eliminate it. If there is a spider, we switch it on, and it's a repulsive force that models that the bumblebee wants to stay away from the, uh, uh, from the spider. And these are simulation results where you can also solve this analytically. If you have no spider, you have some simple exponential decay. So you don't see that your velocity correlation function becomes negative, it remains positive. However, if there's a spider, and well, if you think as a physicist about it, it's a very trivial effect, then you see that the correlation function becomes negative, as we have seen in the data here. So qualitatively, we reproduce this one, that this remains positive. Uh, I should say this uh, is uh, uh, the, the error, so you see this is not an artifact. Really, th this effect is beyond any, numeric, uh, any experimental error. And uh, now, if there is a spider, uh, we reproduce qualitatively at least uh, that this becomes negative. So we have an emergent, uh, this emerges from the interaction between the bee and the flower. Okay, this is a very simplistic model that tell, doesn't tell you very much about the flights. I still have how much? Two minutes or so? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, this is just an advertisement, this one slide, because uh, we did uh, better in terms of modeling the bumblebee flights, but here I don't go into detail. Uh, we have heard already about correlated random walks. So what we did now, we wanted to model the free bumblebee flights, meaning the fly flights far away from a flower, still in the box. And we started with a correlated random walk uh, in 2D, uh, 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 which is a description of the dynamics in the co-moving frame. So meaning you have a picture here. You have the velocities and you have the angle between two velocities at uh, adjacent time steps. 
And uh, so standard uh, correlator random walk means you assume the speed is constant. And then uh, you simply sample the turning angle, the angle between the two velocities, uh, from a non-uniform distribution. Say you may use a wrapped Gaussian distribution, for example. And this models persistence, that your bumblebee uh, flies uh, with a certain probability in the same direction. This is a classical uh, correlated random walk. Now we started from that and we, f we find it. And again, I don't go into detail. I just give you the result. Friedrich did quite a sophisticated data analysis and we really uh, extracted this model from the data. So it's not ad hoc. It's really extracted from real data analysis. And we found uh, that the angle, in fact, uh, is best drawn from uh, Gaussian noise, but it's correlated. Again, with a correlation function. And in fact, the correlations are power law. So the angle is not random, but it persists in time with the power law correlations. And now you see here the velocity. Uh, we sampled it from a function g. So this is, again, friction. And if you have ever heard of active particles, another hot topic uh, in the field of biophysical modeling, this models activity of a biological organism. So it's a kind of activity term. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, Gaussian noise, but it's anti-correlated. So again, with complicated correlation decay. So uh, this may be called a generalized Langevin equation again. So you put it on the computer, and what you get here is exactly the trajectory from our stochastic model. And it seems to reproduce the experimental data very well. We were surprised about that because we, uh, quite some assumptions go in. So if you're interested, this is around as a model for modeling more sophisticated trajectories of moving organisms. OK, so I summarize. Uh, the bumblebees are obviously quite clever. Uh, so they especially adjust their flight modes to the environment. And also, uh, this is the main result. Uh, they have a temporal uh, adjustment to uh, the uh, risk uh, of uh, infected or non-infected flowers. However, we only see it in the velocity autocorrelation functions. Um, yeah, uh, 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 when uh, uh, the spiders are there. Uh, and we qualitatively have reproduced this uh, from a simple stochastic model. OK, uh, we have two uh, papers about that. Uh, so what I've told you about what is mainly published in this uh, first draft letter. And if you're interested in the more sophisticated stochastic model, uh, then uh, we have, this is in, in the second paper. And do I have one more minute? Yes. OK, then because I want to show you this one. Uh, this is something entirely different. Uh, but as we have seen some looping trajectories, uh, I just included this. Uh, and it's a question to you. So uh, this is another project that I am doing, with, again, with experimental biologists at Queen Mary. And they are um, tracking sea turtles. Logger had sea turtles uh, 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 at the coast of South Africa. So uh, here so you see the islands, Cape Verde. And uh, this is the foraging dynamics that you see. It's not Brownian motion, definitely not. So you see there are a lot of loops, right? This is looping over scales of hundreds of kilometers. And I've seen some loops in some talks, right? That's why I asked you. And so I'm just curious if anyone uh, knows any other trajectories of animals that look like that. I mean, I would be very happy to discuss. So I'm just trying to learn whether this is special to the um, sea turtles or whether this is perhaps more general in animal foraging. OK, thank you very much.